Coming up on this week's show, is it the beginning of the end of the Xbox 360? A legendary adventure game series is back. And we chat to rare musical legends, Grant Kirkhope and David Wise. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our incredible friends at Bitmap Books. Now, have you seen A Guide to Japanese Role-Playing Games? Now, this is a book that features every major JRPG release across the last four decades. An unmissable resource for dedicated fans of the genre and, of course, the usual high-quality presentation that you expect from Bitmap Books. You can check that out and the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. And with our lovely friends at PCBWay. Now, they offer a fully featured custom PCB prototyping service. And they've got low-cost, fast turnaround quality boards. And they offer services like 3D printing and injection moulding. And, of course, you know that PCBWay are big supporters of the retro community. So get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 393, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And really nice to have you joining us for another hour-ish of retro gaming and technology goodness, where of course we're going to bring you veterans of the industry onto the podcast to hear their story and keep you up to speed on all the big happenings in the world of retro from over the last seven days. And you know, of course... The sounds I play at the start of the show. If you recognise this, then this is a podcast for you. What was that then, Joe? Blowing your cartridge is either. Of course it was. (laughs) I was going to even try and guess what console it was. (laughs) That sounds like an NES. (laughs) Contra free. (laughs) Oh, now it's for SNES. I've got to give a shout to uh, Save the Sounds.info, which is a website I ripped that off. Um, nice. Unfortunately, it's only audio, so I'm not sure which console it was. <laughs> Must admit, these are getting harder now, so we'll see how many more of these I could do. But of course, it is a podcast where we do get all nostalgic and uh, we keep it to speed on what's been happening in the modern day as well, because I mean, there's lots of new stuff coming out in the retro realm. So, all of that coming up in a second. And I can't believe it is our first show of September. Does that kind of mean summer's over here in the UK? Yeah, and we're uh, approaching that 400th episode as well, aren't we? Mm, that'll be uh, yeah, in just about a month from now, <laughs> middle of October, I think that's going to land. Um, we're obviously making plans behind the scenes for that, but we have actually been very busy over the summer uh, because you might remember that at the back end of last year, that was when we ran a Kickstarter for our book. Now, um, I mean, it has been a while since we talked about the Retro Hour book on the show. I mean, for people that maybe are new listeners, Joe, I mean, give them a bit of a reminder on what this is. So uh, put me on the spot here, mate. So uh, yeah, we had the the crazy idea uh, early last year to uh, document and kind of like preserve in physical form uh, some of our Mm. favourite interviews and kind of build a little bit of a history uh, from our interviews kind of of the the gaming industry really. So we uh, painstakingly (laughs) decided to uh, write a book and uh, obviously it's got lots of added added extras in there. We've got no five bonus interviews going into Mm. it now as well as, you know, personal written articles and all the intros um, and, you know, kind of like box outs and stuff like that, all written by us, you know, all brand new for the book as well. So many pictures. so Lots of pictures. And uh, it's been really nice as well because we've managed to use, you know, like local suppliers and local photographers and stuff like that. Um, So, you know, the money hasn't all just gone, you know, to us or anything like that, or, you know, it's all gone into the book. There's not much left over for us. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And it's, you know, we've used like, local um artists and stuff like that yeah people from the industry as yeah. well haven't we we've, we've supported you know we've licensed a lot of photos from photographers who've worked in the video games yeah. industry for example so i mean we've really put you know most of the money we earn back into this yeah. if we're honest yeah. but it's something that we wanted to do because i mean we've talked about before the fact that you know podcasts uh there's something that it's it, it kind of feels like the difference between having an album pressed onto vinyl versus on spotify doesn't it yeah, yeah. it's uh something physical to hold as well and uh mm. yeah we We've kind of added a lot of bonus interviews, which is awesome. Uh, you know, you're getting some extra stuff there as well if you backed it. And uh, yeah. th- there's one thing we had to keep out, though, which was Dan's dedication to his dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ran out of room. I know that was important I'm sorry, to you, Dan. So <laughs> He's looking at me now, those big sad eyes. You can thank, thank Winston now. But um, it, it is 
at the proof is now. So um, yeah, it's done. Yeah, it's done. It's done. So um, it's it's going to be coming soon, folks. And uh, it's good that that's all kind of wrapped up because we can move on to other stuff like concentrating on the four hundred and uh, making this yeah. podcast awesome. Yeah, so really the big news is that it's at the proofreaders at the moment. And uh, basically, if you did back it on Kickstarter, you should have received your backer's survey this week. You know, to put your address details in there. We ask that everyone that's done that gets it done by September 17th. So then hopefully, you know, it's going to get the printers hopefully next month. And then uh, we can get it into your hands, uh, you know, before the end of the year. So uh, it's a really good place to be. I mean, we did have a lot of people ask us, didn't we, when the Kickstarter finished, like, damn, I missed out on it. Is there any way that I can get hold of a copy of the book? Obviously, we're going to send them out to all the backers first and then kind of see what's left. We're hopefully going to get a few extra ones printed as well. So fingers crossed there will be a chance for uh, other people to to get them at some point as well. But um, obviously, it's been a hell of a journey. You know, it's taken us a uh, best part of this year, um, working night and day to get this book ready. And I, I think I speak for all of us. And there's Simon, who's helped us with it as well, that we're really, really proud of the end result. And um, we know that you're going to love it. So if you did back it, thank you so much for that. Now, of course, we have got an incredible podcast for you this week. And uh, this is actually from... Ravi's travels when you were out in Norway last weekend. Yeah, this isn't me just uh, describing Oslo <laughs> and walking around. This is a, a panel from Retro Mesa, and uh, we've got two absolute musical legends here uh, from Rare. You've got Grant Kirkhope, and uh, Grant actually travelled from Los Angeles to do this panel. And we have mm. David Wise as well. And uh, these guys, you know, they worked on some amazing titles together. And... Uh, there's, you know, a few games like uh, Banjo-Kazooie and, uh, you know, Perfect Dark and Star Fox Adventures, Viva Piñata, quite a few. And we're, we're, we're kind of talking about how they got into the video game music and how they started their career and, and what the kind of path is. And also stuff like, do you need formal training? You know, getting advice from these guys is, is really good. And uh, it's really interesting because, you know, Grant, he's done a lot of stuff that we've not really talked about on the podcast before as well. So uh, recently he did Mario Puss, uh, Rabbids, Sparks of Hope. There was um, Civilization he's done the score for. He's done Super Smash Brothers. The score for movies as well. And uh, David also does, you know, his music music is very, I'd say from different cultures. You know, he, he looks for different backgrounds and he adds that into video games. And it's usually not the kind of sound that you associate with a video game but it works so well and it's it's you know all about getting the correct melodies and that composition and that's what we're going to be talking about on this panel and it's really cool because i love live panels and i love uh you know audience questions as well yeah i mean you know you talk about the music david's done i mean we've had david on the podcast a few times i mean he's a good friend of the show actually lives here in nottingham um just down the road from where i am actually um and if you remember games he worked on for example you know the donkey kong country series how incredible the music is on those and obviously we've done episodes talking all about those games before but this one is something quite different yeah really it's kind of if you've ever had an interest in how these musicians have worked for massive companies like rare and who worked on your favorite games growing up how they kind of entered the industry and their kind of influences and what they use to build these tracks i mean it's quite a an interesting talk you know the, the technical side and of it and the, yeah, the business side yeah and this was done uh, a day after uh, they did a performance on stage, which was, uh, you know, the whole Rare band. They had Kev Bayliss yeah. there as well. And uh, it was quite funny. They were dressed as like Axl Rose, you know, all these kind of like old 80s metalers. And I saw Goldeneye live with Grant Kirkhope playing and Dr. David Doak in his kind of doctor uniform, like his character inside Goldeneye. And it was just oh, nice. absolutely awesome. And they did some live drawing as well. They were doing Donkey Kong Country music and um, Kev Bayliss was actually drawing and then it was getting projected on a screen and stuff. And uh, it was something really nice to see. Um, yeah. There were some of the Japanese composers there and they were all, you know, getting involved and uh, drinking and enjoying it. And uh, yeah, re really good night. So they might sound a little bit croaky, but um, it's still a fantastic <laughs> panel. I think it was your second day there. You might be a bit croaky in this one as well. Oh, right? God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you all sound great. Um, it was a really good panel, actually, and there's more of them to come. So uh, if you couldn't make it out to Norway to Retro Mesa, don't worry, we're going to bring it to your ears. Uh, that panel coming up, the uh, the rare musical legends, Grant Kirkhope and David Wise, on the show in around 
40 minutes from now. But of course, before that, we have lots of new stories to bring you up to speed with in the first half of the podcast. That's what we do. We cast our eyes over the uh, the big headlines so you don't have to. You know, we're the ones that Google around and sit there on Facebook and Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, looking at the news throughout the week. And uh, this one, I must admit, it's weird because um, I was on a another podcast last week. Sorry, guys, for cheating on you. Um, but this is, you know, it's good, good mates of ours. Console Shock. I know you've been on there as well, right? Oh, yeah. Great podcast. Um, yeah, they do brilliant. I think I've been on there about four times now. But yeah, I mean, I was on last week and actually we spent quite a bit of the podcast at the beginning, kind of being amazed that, you know, some of the systems that we probably don't consider all that old are actually knocking on for like two decades of age now, which is nuts. Because I mean, the Xbox 360, I think that turns 20 in about 18 months. Yeah. Start of 2025. I think it's the end. Insane. I want to say October, November 2025. Right. It's about two old. years then, yeah. 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 We haven't got long. And I've got to admit, I mean, I do still play quite a lot of Xbox 360 games. I don't have my 360 set up anymore, but I generally play them all via backwards compatibility on the, uh, the Xbox One, which... Obviously, we'll get into in just a moment. But the fact that it does kind of feel like a, a console that wasn't all that long ago, that that was kind of my main system. Probably because that generation was quite long as well. Um, but now there is some news that it looks like Microsoft are maybe getting ready to uh, retire the, uh, <laughs> I was going to say old reliable, but that probably wouldn't be an <laughs> appropriate phrase for the Xbox 360. Red ring of death. Uh, but it turns out that now this might be the beginning of the end of the Xbox 360, this uh, this news that we spotted over the last couple of days. Yeah, so so the main news really is the Xbox 360 store is going to be shutting down, um, which they officially announced earlier this week. And it's interesting because I should have seen this coming because about a month ago, uh, you know the Games of Gold service, they do alongside Game Pass or which is part of the ultimate Game Pass, you know, just mm. your, your, your gold service to play online. They've always given you free games, about two or three free games a month with that. And they sent an email out about a month ago saying they're no longer going to give out a free Xbox 360 game. It's only for Xbox One and Series X games now. Um, but you can still, you know, use your Xbox 360 to download and, you know, play games and stuff like that. But we should have seen this really coming. Um, so they announced, yep. yep, Xbox 360 store is going to be shutting down. They've given quite a long time on it, which is good. So it's going to be going July 29th, 2024. So just, nearly a year. So just under a year away, which will make it just short of 19 years old when they finally take mm. it out the back door and put a bullet through its head. Um, but, <laughs> but, a brutal way to describe it. Yeah, <laughs> but interestingly, they're not, they're, not, they're not shutting down their online servers or anything like that. So they're saying, while the Xbox 360 titles will no longer be available for online purchase on the console they were originally designed for, you will still be able to download these games uh, if they're backwards compatible onto your Xbox One and your Xbox Series X. Yeah. So these games aren't gone forever if they're backwards compatible. Yeah. And as well as that, you will still be able to, if you already own these games, um, you will be able to download them, etc. You know, re-download previously purchased content and connect with friends on the Xbox 360. So although the store is shutting down, you will still be able to re-download the games you already own, which is nice. However... I can't imagine they will keep that going forever. I think. Well, um, there's been an interview in Eurogamer with uh, Phil Spencer, who's mm. the um, head of Xbox, and he okay. says, mm. you, you know, there's a list of 222 games uh, that are not back compatible, and I have that list stapled to my forehead, and I think, how can we still play them? So yeah. he's talking about, you know, the challenges of preserving it on older hardware, you That's know, make, make, making sure that works, but he says... How about having some of those on the PC or mm. Mm. having it delivered in another way? So, you know, these games might exist, as, as you said, like later on, on, on the other Xbox systems, but um, just not be able to hit the 360. And I can imagine yeah. if they come out on the PC, blatantly they're going to get like ripped and then put back onto the Xbox somehow by, uh, by hackers. To me, this is a really interesting one because, I mean, obviously we had that news that we covered, God, was it about a year, maybe longer ago, you know, when, when Sony were going to shut down the PS3 store. Yeah. And then they suddenly, <laughs> massive backlash, and they were, oh, okay, we'll leave it up a bit longer then. And you can still play the PlayStation 3 online now, I believe. Um, but obviously we know that Nintendo shut down the um, the Wii U. That has been shut down. The 3DS as well, I believe, is gone now, um, back in March this year. The Vita. So, 
Yeah, yeah, and the Vita as well has gone, obviously. Um, but for 360, it's a bit different because when I read this headline at first, I was a bit like, oh, thank God I downloaded some of my DLC for 360 games the other day because my brother and I were playing um, Call of Duty. Uh, we're playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, you know, the original one, yeah. not the, the new version of it, and Modern Warfare 3. Booted it up on my Xbox One that I've got in this room here, and it went online and actually downloaded all the DLC, all the map packs that I'd bought, you know, God, 10, 11 years ago. So I was able, able to do that. And when I read this, I, was, I thought, God, you know, you're not going to be able to do that for much longer. But it turns out, yeah, like you said, Joe, if you've bought this stuff, they're going to give you a way to download it. But I think the difference here is, because you know they killed off the original Xbox service for the OG Xbox, only about eight years after it came out. It wasn't very long. Mm. But because you can play so many of the Xbox 360 games via backwards compatibility, and it does still use the same servers. So if I play an old Xbox 360 game on my Xbox Series X, and I've got a friend who plays it on his 360, you can play those together. It's using the same Xbox Live service. So to me, this it kind of feels like they're not supporting too much additional infrastructure, whereas maybe Sony, I think they, you know, they've got a dedicated service that is just for PlayStation 3. Maybe it's costing their money to keep that running. Maybe it's just that they're really good at like collecting the gamer tags and what, you know, you said you you downloaded it and it had all your maps and stuff and having that yeah. consistency on the on the uh, Microsoft system um, and digital like platform will help you know it move on to another console but um personally i remember the xbox live arcade was one of the first kind of things where i was purchasing games online and downloading them to the system and uh you know not just playing like multiplayer kind of uh online titles i was downloading it from a store and it was arriving yeah. onto my console and that was the kind of groundbreaking for the 360 i was like wow you can get all these like cheap little games and uh it's quite a few arcade conversions and stuff, and it's kind of nice that um, he's talking about preserving all of those. Yeah, and I think the way I see it is the fact that people still play Xbox 360 games today, probably more so than they play PlayStation 3 games, for example. Because my brother told me, you know, when we went on to play Modern Warfare 2 the other day, he said, oh, everyone's playing that again now. He said, have you not seen it? It's like a meme. Yeah. You know, everyone suddenly is, for some reason, it's like even people are going out and buying a copy of it for like two yeah. quid and playing it for like, whether it's quirky reasons or I don't know. Yeah, I, I saw that on Facebook and Instagram and I saw something about it on Reddit. But yeah, like millions of like people have started playing Modern Warfare 1 and 2 and World at War and Black Ops and stuff like that on 360 again. Probably via modern consoles. Though, yeah, I imagine, yeah, I imagine Xbox so. Because if I'm in a lot of the... Uh, the kind of buying and selling groups as well on Facebook. And, you know, mm. lots of people were like pointing out that the CEX stores, for those who don't know, secondhand game shops in the UK, CEX were like putting up these games, which are two pound or all of a sudden like 12 pound, eight pound, <laughs> stuff like that. Cause they'd cut and done to it. And they've probably got millions of copies of them in, on the shelves. I was, I was kind of uh, amazed when I first heard this, that, you know, the Xbox still had a store, but then also the compatibility with Xbox, you know, the fact that you can link them all together and still yeah. kind of mm. play a game just shows like, you know, Microsoft, they must have been working on the same architecture or just kept the same standard or kept updating it, which is uh, really good. I don't know many other kind of consoles that do that. No, that's one thing you've got to commend them for. Yeah, the fact that they do really respect kind of the, the older machines, even though you might not be able to buy them anymore. The fact that people are still keeping these titles active via Emulation on your Xboxes, I think, will probably mean that these games have a longer lifespan than PlayStation 3 games. Um, so, I mean, I can't see them actually shutting down the 360 live service for many years. And I guess hopefully. you can keep all your achievements and stuff like that. As yeah, well. exactly. Yeah, it carries over. Yeah, which is a good thing. So, uh, yeah, it is a bit sad that you're not going to be able to uh, buy new digital games, for example, on the 360. I'm not sure how many people kind of do that now, particularly with the price of, you know, most 360 games came out physically anyway. And they're so cheap, aren't they, generally, mm. to buy them? I mean, you know, I was in CEX in Leeds over the weekend, at like two or three pounds, a lot of these AAA games. It's quite a good, like a good system ago. to collect for, actually, yeah. nowadays. Yeah, good time to do it. But yeah, I mean, it just kind of seem like, you know, they're, they're kind of phasing out that hardware, which is fair enough. You know, it's not going to 20 years old, but obviously there are still ways to play most of the games uh, via modern systems. So, uh, yeah, we'll uh, keep an eye on that story and keep you up to date. Now, let's talk about this. Um, now, this is something that we uh, we covered on the podcast a couple of years ago. You guys did a great interview with uh, Charles Cecil when you were talking about the Broken Sword series. Now, these were classic adventure games from back uh, originally started in, was it 95, 96, the original one came out? 
And um, we've had some very nice news for fans of Broken Sword in the last couple of days. Yeah, there's a, it looks like there's a, a new game coming out and there's also a, a remaster as well. And, mm. it, you know, Charles is involved in this as well. And um, it's great to have the kind of original team on board. And Broken Sword's always had that kind of hand-drawn, hand-illustrated look, um, you know, and that kind of cartoonish look. Now, this looks like it's it's been developed a bit more. Um, you, you know, yeah. they're using modern shader and modern standards, but it's still, to me, got that real kind of broken sword feel to it. Yeah, it, it's so it's going to be uh, Percival Stone, which they've just said they haven't done a release date for it yet because it's not going it, to, but they have confirmed it will come out after the remaster of the original game. Yeah, which is a Shadow of the Templars uh, reforged because yeah. it's it, it, all yeah. about the the Knights Templar and uh, yeah, you know the the kind of myths behind that. But yeah, the the graphical style that you just touched on there—they're calling it Super Two D, which is quite nice. interesting. I so like that cool. name. <laughs> yeah, so the graphic style Super Super Two D—that's uh, a style that applies hand drawn backgrounds to three D geometry. Can't say it. <laughs> 3D geometry, yeah. 3D geometry, <laughs> um, for more for a more cinematic experience. Um, I, I'm not a massive Broken Sword guy. Obviously, the look of Broken Sword, I can see it in my in my mind's eye right now. The original game and getting pushed over by that damn goat. I don't know if this looks a bit too clean, but obviously they've got it's to, different. It's different. They've got to go somewhere with it. They've got to modernize it. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it do, and it does look nice. I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't look nice, but. It is a bit strange because of the 2D sprites, you know, your, your characters, they look they look like they've got a slightly different graphical style to the background, um, which I guess is a purposeful look. But yeah, it, it looks interesting and apparently it's going to be pretty damn brutal uh, with its difficulty. But I know the Broken Sword games can be like that. I think, you know, it, you saying uh, cinematic is, is exactly the word that describes the Broken Sword series. And also when it came out, it was one of those first ones that used, you know, that high end graphics and that much kind of voice acting and, you know, uh, had a, a lot of elements in there. And as the series went on, the graphics changed and increased in a definition and also changed in style a bit as well. So I think this does really, really kind of fit it. And, um, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of kind of modern redos of versions, or this is called a reforged version. Um, and, you know, some of them have really not hit the mark. And this one, to me, looks like it's it's kind of, it's really fitting in with the with the genre. And it's nice to see that, yeah, they're doing a brand new instalment then. So um, Percival Stowe, that's a new game, completely mm-hmm. from fresh, new game. I think the last one, uh, looking at the list here, was in 2013. Yeah. So first new uh, Broken Sword adventure game in a decade. Um, and then they're doing yeah, a reboot of the original game, which I think this is actually the maybe the second or third kind of attempt to kind of do a you know a, an HD upgrade of it. There was a director's cut that apparently came, I didn't see this, but it came out in 2009, which was okay. a kind of an HD version of it. But I've read reviews of that today that a lot of people saying they didn't really like that version because it cut quite yeah. a bit out. I, I played the original the, the on uh, Scum VM as well. But, yeah. you know, obviously the resolutions are really low. Yeah, well, I mean, it looks like this is, you know, we've only got a few seconds of it in this trailer, uh, but really it looks like just a, an HD upgrade of the original game, from what I can see, you know, hopefully with the, the full introduction sequence and all that that was apparently missing from the director's cut that came out back in 2009. So, uh, again, I think you're right, Ravi, having the, having the original team behind it, having Charles involved, that's so important, isn't it, to kind of keep that the storyline going and make sure it actually feels like a a game from this series. Yeah. It, you know, obviously something that's been going that long, it's got a lot of hardcore and fans. So, uh, also yeah. they did, um, you know, revolution. They did that beyond a, a steel sky as well. Yeah. Um, which I still haven't played. Which, <laughs> I bought that last year at retro Mesa, I think. Which looking at the style of this as well, um, seems, seems quite similar. Obviously it's in a sci-fi environment and world and it's less kind of cartoony, but the, the way that the shading's done in it, it, it looks quite similar to that. Yeah, and the fact they're working on, you know, essentially two games at once, um, I imagine they're quite busy right now, so uh, we'll keep an eye on that as we get closer to the release date. If you want to check out that trailer, I'll put that in, of course, the rest of the stories. You can check them out every week on your podcast app. Check the show notes or head to our website at theretrohour.com. Now I can hear Joe almost squealing with excitement to get to this next story. <laughs> squealing with pain. 
I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I'm squealing with rage. <laughs> squealing with rage. Um, I mean, it, it, bottom line, this is cool. This is really cool. So Arcade One Up have announced uh, Time Crisis Deluxe, their latest, uh, you know, three quarter scale pop up arcade machine for your home. It's just wicked. Absolutely awesome. Time yep. Crisis. We've got the light guns. We've got two light guns, which we'll get onto in a minute because the first Time Crisis game was on only one player. Um, but we've, yeah, it's Time Crisis. What more can I say? We've got the pedal on there. It looks wicked. It's got. Whenever you go to an arcade and you're with Joe, if he vanishes and there's a Time Crisis machine, you know exactly where that, it's that, at. Yeah. That's the only one that I got into, like, but that and Point Blank, which is yeah. also on this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the decals on the side, everything about this, it looks so 90s. It's awesome. You know, you've got uh, the Time Crisis dude on the side. I don't actually know his name. And I'm assuming it's the same similar technology to the Sind and Light Gun because obviously it's going to be an LCD screen in there. Um, yeah. And like I say, you've got the pedal, you've got the red and the blue gun, which have got the, the awesome electronic recoil on there as well. The absolutely tiny pedal that you'll probably break as well because I remember yeah, the maybe. Time Crisis one was big. Yeah, yeah And yeah, if you've yeah. got if you've got two people going on that for the reload as well, that's going to get hammered, yeah, isn't it? That is going to get hammered. But yeah, got like I say, two two gun cons on there. Town Crisis 1 was only one player, so I assumed, because Arcade 1 up do do this, they do put, you know, three or four, ca- you know, they will base it on one game and then they'll put like another four in that one cabinet. Um, but yeah. as you say, Rav, we've got point, point blank, blank on there. And then uh, Steel Gunner 1 and 2. Never played Steel Gunner games, personally. No, me neither. Um, but yeah, the uh, the downfall is the eye-watering price tag that does come with this pre-order of $750. Which, I mean, look, there's light gun technology in there. But, so I imagine but, but, but this is, it costs it have, more than just a joystick. Does it have recoil? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it, it has the recoil. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, 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 it's, got the electro- it's yeah. electronically powered recoil on there. I pay more for awesome. the recoil, definitely, with that game. But yeah, man. I mean, pff, how much are the other arcade one ups? They're between between two hundred and four hundred and fifty, depending on what cabinet it is. You know, I mean, a couple of them, mostly about three hundred quid. The ones I see in the UK these days, because we do get them. We don't get as much as a selection as in America in the States. But yeah, I've never, I've, I've not seen one. I think they did a Big Book Safari one. I feel like they might have done that, which might have been closer to this, to this kind of cost, this price point. And as you say, Ravi, it is probably because of the light gun technology and yeah. what they've and done I, with it. And I think they must use like a very small guy when they're doing the promo shots for this because... Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we've said this yeah. before. They're, they're yeah. not going to have a big dude because these machines like it's going to be hard to get that close and that tight in um with that you put them on a table i guess don't you that's yeah yeah you know when they did the teenage mutant uh, ninja turtles one they had the um wider kind of thing to have four people in and that you're still like really cramped up on that um can't imagine what this one's going to be like with two people trying to stamp on each other's foot constantly yeah yeah Um, i mean i mean there was a big divide in the middle of the um original well, in Time Crisis 2, I remember, yeah. between the two I mean, players. The only, the only thing I can think of is that I don't, I've not played Steel Gunner, so I don't know if that uses a foot pedal to reload, but I know Point Blank, you just, I don't think you even have a reload in Point Blank, you know, you just shoot the screen. <laughs> you just go and, for it, depending on what mini game it is. And um, some people were saying some of the screenshots are from the PlayStation version of the... Um, of uh, Time Crisis. Oh, really? Yeah, right. And not the arcades. So they're not oh. sure if it's going to be the PlayStation version or the arcades. Obviously, the arcades is is, is what you want if you've got an arcade unit. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say, yeah, I mean, if they're selling this as an arcade, and, you know, obviously the, these. I mean, the, the were home ports that not a lot of people play, but if I think of these Namco light gun classics, I'm thinking, you know what, yeah, arcades. And I think that for that price, $750, if, if it's not the arcade versions, I imagine that might be a bit of a backlash interesting Ravi's just said that I, I watched the trailer to this earlier on and you literally see about two seconds of actual time crisis footage and you're right Ravi you can actually see the analog like the yeah little, like um your reticle if you're using the analog sticks to play or your and then you know, point the blank was on the playstation as well so I'm thinking yeah <laughs> maybe yeah could be right with that one Ravi oh dear <laughs> um but yeah I mean when <laughs> I, first I still thought, want it <laughs> yeah I still want it <laughs> Yeah, that's the bottom line. Maybe now you said for... recoil. Like... Yeah. I mean, how much are this, this? I mean, I know these aren't Sindon light guns. I mean, it was probably the same technology, but 
the Cinder Knight guns, I think, are about, I want to say they're about £200 anyway. I think, yeah, I think they're quite expensive and they have recoil in it. But from yeah. what I've heard, they're, they're totally worth it as well. Yeah. This is I mean, you look at that, that there are other ones, tech, I mean... Yeah. They've also announced that they're going to be doing a, um, a deluxe edition cabinets for Gallagher Street Fighter 2 and the Atari 50th anniversary. Um, these cabinets are going to cost $500. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine if you're factoring in maybe another 200 for the light guns yeah. and oh, that yeah, the kind of work Terminator out. Terminator 2 one, which I think we did cover a while ago, uh, $700. I don't think we had the price point of it, though. I'll yeah. wait for one to come cheap on Facebook Marketplace and then yeah. repurpose it so I can play Crime Patrol with recoil. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Mad my... Uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, Often, I'm not sure whether we ever even get UK releases of a lot of these anyway. I generally will see, like, US pricing. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, whether we'll even be able to get a hold of one, you know, if you have the cash to spare. But it is quite cool to see, you know, th- these games... I mean, I, I do think it is really important that it is the arcade version of these, uh, if, you know, if you've got an arcade cabinet. Um, just being able to play, have the arcade experience yeah. with something that looks like this with the light guns in the home is a big selling point, I think, for me. So uh, we'll link up that uh, little trailer if you want to check it out so far no clarification on the exact versioning yet but of course we will let you know now we have got some uh, more stories to tell you about in just a minute including something very cool for uh, my first computer which for some reason seems to be getting a lot of love at the moment so we'll talk more about that in just a moment and also a way to uh, upgrade your sega saturn 3d controllers now before we do that let's just take a second to uh, talk about something that is so important to this podcast and really the reason that we're here all these years later rapidly approaching episode 400 and that is thanks to our wonderful patrons community because i mean that is a lifeblood of this show isn't it just really helps us out so much yeah 100 percent um just the community and the support we get from the patrons has really really we really kept the the show alive and you know i'll say it i have had no end of issues with my computer and my kind of home studio set up this last kind of two three months joe has been ripping his hair out with the wireless (laughs) Um, yeah Yeah. oh god you don't want to know guys (laughs) yeah it's been absolutely terrible but because we have the patreon and because we have the support we're able to you know to fix these things get these things you know pay for these things to be fixed and stuff like that and sort them out and you know we, we we literally wouldn't have a show right now if it wasn't for that um, it's it's really amazing like i went out to norway and i hung around with a patron and we went out to oslo and stuff and he invited me into his house you know we had a uh, uh, patrons coming up to us you know uh, coming out for a drink as well and it was just fantastic the whole kind of community and all the people around the world as well and it really helps the podcast but also we kind of add some bonus stuff in there for you so uh we've got the after hours podcast uh which we've just recorded one of episode 37 that you can uh, we're talking about licensed games in the latest one which if you join us on patreon as a gold member or above you'll get access to that from this weekend after i've uh, edited it up and also you get the uh, usual podcast um ad free you get uh, about 10 15 minutes of extra news on every single episode uh, you get it early some weeks if i can get it turned around in time and uh, also you get access to our patrons only discord section of the the uh, Discord server, which, you know, we're chatting away in pretty much every day on there, aren't we? We've got a great little community. And, of course, a big thing that all patrons get invited to that we do uh, usually on the last Sunday of every month. We've just had one, and that is the Patrons Hangout. This is where we invite all our patrons to come on, basically a massive video call where we all nerd out about all kind of things. And Really, it's great because it's got a real international flavour to it, hasn't it? I'd say, you know, this week probably half of our audience was from overseas, wasn't it, on the, on the Hangout, which was... Um, just incredible to see. So if you'd like to get involved in that and become part of the Retro Hour patrons community, all the details to sign up right now and support the show are at theretrohour.com. And of course, we induct new members into the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, and that is the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> and let's welcome our newest patrons. Thank you so much to Girolamo Castaldo. Hakon Puntavold. And Daniel Lukes. You all join us on Patreon over the last week. We massively appreciate your support and all the details to join our wonderful patrons community are on the website right now at theretrohour.com. That is weird because I remember getting my uh, my first machine when I was seven years old. I've talked about this on the podcast before. You know, used computers at school, really wanted one at home. And then my mum uh, got me a Commodore Plus 4. Now, at the time when I was a kid, I didn't know the reputation that the Plus 4 had. For generally being a bit of a naff machine, I mean, really it was intended as a, you know, originally a, really a business computer, really. And then they kind of sold them off 
at a fire sale. I think my mum got mine for about £99 with like 25 games included with it as well. Um, I remember a lot of other kids at school getting them that Christmas too. So uh, obviously they sell them off very cheap. But one thing you'd always find when you had a Commodore Plus 4 is the kind of few games that were ports of kind of big, you know, what we call AAA games right now were generally a bit crap on the Plus 4. We've got stuff like, uh, if you, you guys ever get a moment to uh, check out the Commodore Plus 4 version of Paperboy on YouTube. It's not something you'd ever want to play <laughs> for literally any amount of time at all. It's not even worth the cassette tape it came on. And I remember going to game shops and like, you know, it got to a stage where really, if you asked for Commodore Plus 4 games, the shopkeeper would generally sneer at you a little bit. And I remember one of them actually flat out telling me, I'd just throw your computer in the bin if I were you. So that's, it didn't have a great reputation. But the thing is, in recent months, I mean, there has been a scene around the Commodore Plus 4 and uh, its younger sibling, the uh, the Commodore 16, which is basically just a, a Plus 4 in a Commodore 64 style case with 16K of RAM. But for some reason, the, the homebrew scene on this machine has just kind of blown up over the last couple of months. And there are people doing things that is just nothing short of amazing on these systems right now. Now, we've covered a couple of these in the news over the last couple of months, I think mainly in the patron section. But now someone has actually ported the Jeff Crammond classic stunt car racer to the Commodore Plus 4. And, you know, as someone who's owned a Plus 4 for, God, about 35 years now, I can't believe that this machine was capable of running something this well all this time. I mean, obviously, I imagine you're familiar with the original game, Ravi. I mean, what do you think of this new version? I think this is well impressive. Like, from the stuff that we've seen with the Plus 4, it's just been a few sprites, and it's been kind of... Well, it doesn't even have sprites. Well, yeah, it's one well, that kind doesn't of, have sprites at all. <laughs> uh, yeah. People attempting to do them and stuff, and yeah. uh, seeing a full 3D track. You know, I've always thought Stunt Car Racer is, like, one of these games where it uses kind of minimal technology, and it really pushes the system, and... Uh, you know, the physics in there and uh, how it runs. It's always kind of been a little test of, you know, your machine's power as well. Uh, a lot like later on Frontier, everyone would load that up and be like, oh, look, the intro is working better with an accelerator. But um, yeah. seeing something like this on a plus four, I would not expect it to be at this frame rate. You know, it looks very playable. <laughs> yeah, really playable. And, and and the thing is, there's everything in here you'd expect from it. Now, really, this is, it's a port of the Commodore 64 version. But the thing is, I mean, when we got 64 ports to the Plus 4 back in the day, they generally strip out a load of stuff. Yeah. Because it didn't have the hardware sprites. It doesn't have a SID chip, you know. They generally it'd be a terrible port. But this thing here, I mean, it's pretty much, you know, I haven't played the, the 64 version all that much. I mean, I generally played it more on the Amiga back in the day. But from looking at video side by side, this almost feels like a you know a perfect port of the sixty four. Yeah, version. it's obviously with a few changes. It's quite small. Um, yeah, on the screen, you know, it's not a full screen uh, title, but uh, you know, you're gonna have one of these like letterbox windows um, if if you're running something like this. But also, um, I don't know if it's the ghost car that's also running on there as well, or if if there's another racer in there. I, I can't quite remember it, um, but I think it had a like ghost car that would go around and show you previous. Um, progression on the track and seeing that as well on the plus four is uh, absolutely mental. Yeah, I mean, the gameplay looks exactly as I remember it. Uh, and apparently all the cheats, you know, from the Commodore 64 version and stuff work on here as well. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty much reinterpreted code on there. Um, the, the graphics have been changed to use the TED colours because the Commodore, the Commodore plus four was really one of the earliest kind of what we call today a system on a chip. You know, the Raspberry Pi, like you've got the GP, what yeah. we call the GPU and the CPU, and they're all in kind of one little unit. So it was all on the what was called the uh, the TED chip. But um, there have been a few little things in here as well, which, um, you know, stuff like the uh, the Hall of Fame is uh, loadable from disc or cassette tape now as well. So, you know, you don't lose your high score table. Um, there's there's a lot in here. I mean, the, I'll, I'll link up the, the, the notes if you want to check it out as well. But really, I think the big news here is it is just insane to see what they're doing on the Commodore Plus 4 at the moment. Because, I mean, we kind of had this about five, six years ago, the Amstrad machines, didn't we? Yeah. People kind of making our jaw drop with ports that we didn't expect were possible on that. Do you think a little little Dan's mind would have been blown if he, yeah. if he oh, saw God, this yeah. back in the day? <laughs> and I wish I had this to show that smug shopkeeper who told me to throw it in the bin. Yeah, there you, look, there you, can you run go. This. Look at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad I didn't. 
Yeah, so uh, exactly. I'm glad I kept it all this. All I had to do is wait till 2023. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it does look really impressive. So that is available to uh, download now for free if you want to see uh, what the Plus 4 and uh, Commodore 16, if you have 64K in your machine, is capable of. Stunt Car Racer is now playable on there. Now, this is something else that's really quite creative. And um, when I first read this headline, I was like, how on earth have they done this? Now, this is the Sega Saturn 3D control pad. Now, this was one of the earliest kind of controllers with an analog stick that I ever remember seeing. And I think this was actually designed pretty much exclusively originally for playing Nights into Dreams, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, you could actually get a like a box set with Nights into Dreams with it, you mm. know, with the uh, the black Sega Sega Saturn 3D controller. Um, but yeah, this looks this looks really interesting. Um, so a modder, geeky fab has created a USB-C adapter for it. Now, I'm ashamed to say I don't actually have the 3D controller for the Sega Saturn because they're pretty expensive. Oh, call, yourself, call yourself a Sega fan. I, I, I thought, I thought this would now. be your prized possession. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have one. They're getting pretty pricey. I know you have one, don't you, Dan? Uh, yeah, I got mine for about 15 quid about a decade ago. Yeah, they, they, they're definitely a lot more than that now. Um, but it seems they have like a where the, the cable goes in it's actually removable by the looks of things. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's got like a little clip that you push down and it removes the controller. Like, it's like a docking system, you know. Um, not too dissimilar from the Dreamcast controller because the, the 3D controller, the Sega Saturn 3D controller, was kind of like, if you will, a, a bit of a prototype to the Dreamcast controller. Yeah. And it's interesting mm. to see. It's got this docking for the cable on the back where there's essentially like an, an inch by inch plastic square kind of comes out with the cable and what he's done is he's built a USB-C adapter for that and in this like it's only about a minute long this video but it then shows him off kind of like using this as a you know a modern controller now obviously he's not gonna be able to play Call of Duty on it because we've not got any L and R buttons on there and most notably there is only the one analog stick on the left hand side mm. but you know he's playing games such as Cuphead you know which only requires you know, the one stick, and he's also emulating um, Super Mario, you know, on the NES. Yes. Yeah. See Nintendo things running on a Sega pad. Yeah. Being played with a Sega pad is blows my mind. It's, like, it's what, what? mad because it's, it's like this tiny little device that you just clip in. Mm. Yeah. And I assume he's going to have to have power conversion in there coming from the USB-C and have it powered, uh, you know, through that. And then yeah. he's going to have to have some kind of like little driver and a translator that's then going to be picked up by, you know, Windows 10 or the Raspberry Pis. Yeah. Um, all in this little tiny, you know, less than a memory card yeah, uh, yeah. size little clip and keeping it, you know, at, at 16 pounds, basically. Yeah. Which so, is <laughs> just yeah. mad that someone can do this on their own, you know? Yeah. Th th and that that's the mad thing. This is for sale. Um, yep. But like you say, it's for, for 2,980 yen, which is roughly 16 pound or $20, um, which is fantastic. It doesn't run on, so when I say modern systems, it doesn't run on Xbox or PlayStation by the looks of things, but it runs on Windows 10, 11, Raspberry Pi, Retro Freak and stuff like that, uh, which is cool. And um, he's uh, open sourced it as well. So, um, yeah. you know, someone might be able to do that in the future um, because... Mm. He's, he's put a PDF of the circuit board out there. So uh, it's on GitHub and people can, you know, join in and kind of change it. Which I think is cool because, you know, if he's putting the driver up on GitHub and the, the PDF of the circuit boards, I mean, like you said, Joe, it's, it's only available from Japan at the moment. Yeah. Um, well, it's actually not available at all. You know, it's out of stock completely. Oh, okay. You can sign up for a restock. Yeah, you can sign up for a restock notice when out, out of stock in seven days by the looks of it. Um, I imagine cost of the price, anyone that's got a Sega Saturn in one of these and heard about it and lives nearby probably just bought them straight away. But hopefully that will mean that there the can be kind of people making these in different parts of the world, yeah. which will be quite cool to see. I mean, I've got no need at all for this, but for some reason I want it. Because, <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know. I'm ashamed to say, I mean, I've had this controller for, like I said, a decade. I always saw that little tab at the back, but I didn't know you could actually kind of remove the, the controller plug it's, it's from the... It's such a neat solution, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because, I mean, I hadn't really seen that till you know, when... God, probably the Xbox 360, you know, when that had like, a, you know, you could plug a cable in or, or remove it. It's quite a bizarre addition to to have that on, 
something like the Sega Saturn to be able to unplug it, you know, something that isn't a wireless controller. Yeah. But um, obviously, for something like this, it's, it's really cool. So um, if you have got one of those uh, controllers lying around and you want to put it to good use, um, these look very cool and very affordable as well. Now, while we're talking about things that are just, you know, completely bat crazy um, and people are doing just because they can, if you want to run Linux on your Commodore 64, Ravi? Not particularly, but uh, I've got a feeling you're going to tell me that I can. Yeah, well, you're a very patient person. Now, this is actually quite timely because I did see uh, uh, a post the other day. I put this on my uh, my YouTube channel on the, the community section on there as well. A lot of screenshot that it was actually 30 years ago this week on the 26th of August that Linus Torvalds first went on to Usenet to announce Linux. So um, that is 30 years ago this week. He actually said, uh, it's a little hobbyist project. He doesn't think it'll get too big. Yeah. <laughs> and I think now it's on uh, pretty much every server in the world. Um, but as we all know, you know, hobbyists love a challenge. So uh, there was that story a while ago of them getting um, Linux running on an original Macintosh, an Apple Mac, which I thought was um, pretty nuts anyway. But now one developer, um, his name is Ono Courtman, and he's posted this on Slashdot. And now he's basically managed to get the, the Linux kernel booting on a 1982 Commodore 64 with the MOS Technology 6502 processor and 64 kilobytes of memory. Now, there's a video that you can watch as well. And um, at the moment, it looks like he was only doing this on an emulator, not original hardware, but they're saying that, you know, theoretically this should be possible. Oh, no, so... Because he uses... I've, I've, yeah, I mean, he's using... Well, he's using the Vice emulator, which is a Commodore 64 emulator, and he, uh, he uses warp mode in there, which basically makes it, you know, a hell of a lot quicker just because he didn't have kind of, you know a week to wait. Well, well, <laughs> talking situation. of that, um, uh, taking a week for it to boot, I was chatting to a uh, John Bird, who's one of the contributors of our book. And he actually mm. contacted me and said, have you seen a guy called Emule for, and, um, he's actually streaming, uh, booting <laughs> Linux on a C64 for a week. Right. <laughs> so he linked me to one of the videos and uh, uh, it's 10 hours long and it's the, wow, it's okay. only one part <laughs> of it. But um, if you check out ML4's channel, he's basically attempting to get this booting on real hardware and uh, yeah. streaming the screen as it goes over a week with people just chatting some of the comments like, this is insanity. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> uh, just seeing how this this live boot essentially is uh, going to work. I mean, you're not going to be running, you know, Ubuntu desktop on your Commodore 64, but the fact that you can basically, you know, get into a login, you know, there's... Uh, yeah, I don't think you'll even yeah. be able to run any software on there, but no, you'll just be no, like, yeah, I mean, I'm in a Linux environment on the C64. There you go, world. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. I mean, the, the developer, Courtman, he's saying that there is actually a lot of room for improvement. He said there could be uh, up to a 10 times speed up of this, so you might only have to wait, what, two and a half days for it to load up rather <laughs> than a week. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's one of these things that there is no practical use for it at all. It's just cool, isn't it? You know, so someone's obviously decided that now it is possible to run Linux. I'm, I'm just watching at the moment. Windows. He's just put a video. It took two days to boot Linux on a C64 video and it's live at the moment. Maybe uh, by the time this podcast goes out, he may have booted it in two days. But uh, yeah, check check that channel <laughs> out because they're, they're going constant and... Uh, you know, people are chatting and viewing it, and it's it's pretty hilarious, to be honest. That's your weekend taken up now, isn't it, Ravi? Just staring yeah, at that. just like that <laughs> moment that it boots, everyone's going to go, yeah. Now, you know we love crazy stuff like that, so, uh, yeah, more power to you. So you've got to check out the uh, that little article and uh, the live stream as well. I'll chuck that down for you and put it in our show notes. You don't have to Google around. I'll save you the effort. All the details are at theretrohour.com. Now, we're going to be hearing Ravi's panel live with the rare musical legends, Grant Kirkhope and David Wise from Retro Mesa in Norway in just a moment. Before we do that, I know you've had a long day at work today, Joe. Nine hour shift, was it, before you uh, yeah. jumped on the podcast? Yeah, there? nine, nine, maybe. Well, probably out of the house for about 11 hours if you include travel <sighs> and stuff like that. Long day. That's the thing. When you, when you get in the office in the morning, when there's so much to do. And uh, actually, our friends are wonderful sponsor this week. It's 
Notion. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea behind Notion is, you know, we love this service, and I must admit, I've been using this uh, to help me out on a load of things. You know, I do social media management for a few clients. I have to do newsletters and that kind of thing. I also have my YouTube channel. This has been helping me out with quite a lot of that because that is one thing that you'll find if you do uh, any kind of office-based job or anything, you know, maybe run your own business or collaborate with teams, really. Just have a think about how many different tools you have to log into each morning. I mean, talking about you, Joe, it's Google Docs has got to be open. Yep. Gmail. Outlook. Teams, yeah. Microsoft Teams, yeah. as in there, Chat yeah. GPT. Dropbox, <laughs> Trello, Discord, Figma, yeah, Chat GP. I mean, is that all the time? And actually, that can really help you out with this as well because Notion is basically a single space where you can think, you can write, you can plan, you can capture your thoughts, manage projects, even run an entire company and do it the way you want. Now, rather than paying for all these different services that you use each month and trying to make them talk to each other, Notion keeps everything together in one tidy place. So it's just what you need in a world where there's too many services scattered across too many places, too many notifications as well. Aren't you sick of all those constant alerts on your phone and everything too? So this can be like to-do lists, you know, for you or your team, company goals, planners, marketing plans. The great thing about it is just how visually rich it is as well. You can embed images, videos, make gorgeous documents. You can do like, you know, Team Wikipedia, your product roadmaps as well. You can even manage team-wide projects, track deals on board new employees. You can even publish articles directly to the web from here as well. And of course, like everything, all great services right now, they've got artificial intelligence built in as well. And what's more is Notion's got AI built into all of their tools. So that means it's across your notes, your documents, your planners. You don't have to jump out and, you know, log into ChatGPT. It actually automates all the tedious jobs in your day job. And you can focus on the things that you're best at. You know, it can even help you. One great thing I love about it is it can help you basically turn your, uh, your messy brain farts, as we call it, into finished products just at the mm. click of a button. So Notion AI helps you work faster, write better, and think bigger by doing tasks that normally take you hours in just seconds. Now, we're big fans of Notion AI, and I know whatever you do, it's going to really help you out whether you work with a team or individually as well. So why don't you try Notion AI for free? And of course, by helping our sponsors, that really helps out the podcast as well. So take advantage of these offers. We'd really appreciate it. All you need to do is visit notion.com slash retro. So that's all lowercase letters, notion.com slash retro, and try out the incredible power of Notion AI today. And of course, use our link and you're supporting the podcast as well. Notion.com slash retro, and I'll put that in our show notes as well. And a massive thank you to our friends at Notion for their support of our show. Okay, next we're crossing over to Norway for uh, Ravi's panel last week, one of uh, several panels we'll be bringing you over the next couple of months. Uh, this one really interesting with uh, the musical legends of Rare, Grant Kirkhope and David Wise. That panel is coming up next on the Retro Hour podcast. Hello, Retro Messer. Oh, can you, oh, can you hear me? We're, we're on. on. We're yeah, on. you're on. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> so... I'm here with two absolutely legendary composers. Legendary. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> We've got David Wise and Grant Kirkhope. How are you doing, guys? Very well. How are you? We're, we're good. good. Have, you, have you enjoyed the expo so far? I have indeed. Yes. Yeah. Had a great night at karaoke last night. Oh, it an was. amazing that gig as good. well, if, if any of you saw that. Great yeah. night at karaoke. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and if anybody missed that, on the 3rd of March next year, <laughs> in Stuttgart, we'll be doing the same thing, but bigger. Yes. Oh, nice. And uh, you're going to have more fancy dress as well. Uh, definitely more fancy dress, absolutely. <laughs> I've got a few cosplay outfits already sorted out for that one. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking we are going to talk about your careers for a bit, and then there's some questions from the audience. So um, first question I was going to ask, like, who were your main musical influences growing up? Well, I used to listen to ABBA. Good choice. Yeah, I think it's a great choice as well. It's a good choice. So, yeah, I mean, in all honest, honesty, um, they're, they're really good composers, aren't they? Mm, brilliant. So they, they were a big influence. And um, I, I also used to listen to a lot of classical music like Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and people like that. So a lot of Russian composers. Unfortunately, I'm not that, uh, that, that intelligent. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I listen to mostly heavy metal, usually. So I guess for me, if it was like Judas Priest, uh, Saxon, Nine Maiden, Van Halen, Queensryche. I do like Nightwish these days. So uh, that kind of stuff is what I used to like. And also, I kind of, after the first Batman film that Danny Elfman composed, I loved that score to, that, to the first Batman movie. And so that kind of got me into listening to more score based stuff. And that was the first that kind of score that I actually bought and played it in the car over and over again. I thought that was amazing. 
Um, and I, I was you know, a bit like Dave, I was classically trained, I played trumpet, you know, I did that for years and went through school, went to music college and all the rest of it, so I played in orchestras and stuff. But, um, so I guess a bit of both, really, but mostly metal. I mean, you know, to, be, to be fair, when I got older, I did listen to a lot of rock music. He did stuff. indeed. I, I went through the phase. I've seen the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> That's before I got into EDM. So. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering then, you had a background in, in music and you mentioned classical training and stuff. How important is that? Do you think if you're starting a career in music, can you come from that background, but also another... Just I bet we're going to get different answers here. You go. Well, I, I mean, as for classical training, I had piano lessons when I was a kid. Then I started playing trumpet and went to join Ratby Brat Bass. Rat, brat, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Ratby Brass Band. So in Rat Ratby. Me. Yes. And then I, I decided to play drums in a punk band. And um, I did that for years because it was more fun than playing the piano. So that was my background. And it wasn't until I started working at Rare when I was about 18 or 19 years old, that I started listening to a lot of soundtrack stuff. I've got to say, I don't think it's important to have any kind of musical training whatsoever. I think if you want to get involved in it and do it, you should just do it, right? I don't think me being a, spending four years at the Royal Northern College of Music doing a music degree made any difference to me at all. Like all the stuff that I got taught there, I just thought was boring. And, and the one thing I, that I, I took away from the college was the college orchestra rehearsed every Tuesday and Thursday mornings from nine till one, and I never missed those rehearsals in nine years, in fact, uh, four years. I used to just sit and watch them and listen to the music. So I kind of feel like if you can hear it, you can write it. So I don't think you need any immediate, immediate education. We, we know tons of composers that carry music and I haven't got a clue, but they write great music. So kind, I kind of surrounding yourself with yeah, music. Yeah, I don't think it matters. So. I think you just need to do it. Get stuck in and do it. Yeah, I didn't go to college or music school or anything like that. But but, my, my education was pretty much at rare and learnt on the job. Yeah, prime example. So don't think you need to learn to read music or any of that stuff. Just buy, buy a keyboard, buy a guitar, buy a synth and mess around with it. Do some YouTube tutorials. Exactly. And, yeah, and also these days, there's such a lot on YouTube. You can learn such a lot from that. I've learned tons from YouTube just about mixing stuff and mastering and things. So I feel like it's, there's a wealth of information out there. Just get stuck in. I was wondering then, how did you get involved with the video game music industry? Well, I was working at a music shop. That's, well, that was my first <laughs> I job. I thought you say, I was working. I was a waitress. <laughs> in a cocktail <laughs> when I met you. Uh, so I was just working in a music shop and two blokes came in called Tim and Chris. Who happened to, um, they had a company called Ultimate Play the Game and they were setting up this company called Rare Limited. And um, I was demonstrating some equipment to them and they basically bought the equipment and me... And that's how I got into it. So um, you could say it was a bit fluky, but I'd learned how to program the actual equipment that I was demonstrating. So it was, it was a logical progression. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So I guess I was, um, I was uh, went to university, well, not music college for four years, and I left there 22. And I spent the next 11 years playing in rock bands, really, um, off, on and off unemployment, you know, most of the time. Um, some bands did well, some bands did terribly. Um, and I had a mate called Robin Beanland, who was a keyboard player in one of the local bands that I played at. And one day he announced he'd got a job at Rare. Uh, I think Dave interviewed him and gave him the job. I did. And, um, and he, I'd be, he'd been about a year and a half and said to me, Grant, you know, you've been on, the, on unemployment for about 11 years, because I had been on and off. He said, you know, why didn't you try to do what I'm doing? And I was like, I suppose I could have try. So I bought a, a bit of gear, I bought a, a synthesizer and a keyboard and a copy of Cubase. And I spent like 1994 writing music that I thought was appropriate for video games. I sent rare five cassette tapes, never got a reply. And out the blue, I got a letter saying, come for an interview. And Dave interviewed me and foolishly gave me the job. <laughs> uh, <you know? laughs> so it was, a, like Dave said, it's a complete fluke. I, I kind of feel like so much, many of us fell into it by a complete fluke. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I spent 11 years in playing in bands, getting nowhere, and thought I'd end up a tramp, really. That's what I thought at the end of it all. And Dave thankfully hired me. <laughs> there we go. And it regrets it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and unfortunately, we didn't get kicked out onto the street. That's so, right. But yeah. We did come from the gutter. Yeah, and, we did. You know, but at least we're here now. <laughs> so when you, when you first started kind of making music for video games, what's it like compared to making music now with the tools and how, how it's changed the methods of creating it? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, for me, I feel like I write music the same now as I did when I started at Rare in 1995, like I, I'm not a very intellectual composer, so, so I just kind of mess around until I hear something that I like. I load up a sample, a clarinet, or a synthesizer, or whatever, and try and get like, some chords or a melody, and then 
just you know step by step just build it up into whatever you can i mean you know tech wise as though sample has changed yeah so yeah the quality is better so you know back then we had like it's pretty crap quality but you get these big huge sample libraries now which sound like live orchestras and all that stuff so and you know you can buy this stuff you could get the bbc symphony orchestra the library that i use the professional model you can get the I think you can get the core version for like $50 mm. and it gives you access to all the orchestra instruments, right? So anybody, any one of you could buy that for 50 bucks. You can sit at home with it and you can put it together orchestral sounds. It means people can, you know, it's, if some people are frightened about trying to get stuck in doing that stuff. You just can, it's cheap to buy the, the, the base version and you can mess around with it. By contrast, Grant's first job was putting music. He was converting the stuff from the SNES on Donkey Kong Country 2. That's right onto GBA, so it was a really poor sound chip. It had four monophonic channels. It had a noise channel, which went... There was a triangle channel, which sounds like an owl hooting. <laughs> and then there's two really nasty pulse wave channels. And um, that, it was as basic as that. And so Grant had asked me... Well, I'd asked Grant to convert this music, and I think the first day you were, you were quite put off weren't you yeah because like my first as I got to rare like I'd never I thought I'd be using midi files like I was at home right and then Dave came in and said yes so your job's to convert um, Donkey Kong Country 2 Dave which is a fantastic score um, to um, to work in the original Game Boy and I was like alright that sounds interesting and he said yeah this is what you have to use I was like oh my god it's like it was just like four you know like a, a black and white screen with numbers on it and Dave went yeah you do it like this Right, see ya. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm, this is, this is, I thought I have to resign. I thought, it's just way too hard. And, and I, and I, so what, what we were doing, we were typing hex numbers and mm. codes into a, an assembler. We'd assemble it, and we'd have to wait a minute or two, and then it would play it back to us. So there was no playing on the keyboard. We were just, like, got the note on the keyboard, typed it in, assembled it, it would play it back to us. So it was yeah. a very, very long-winded process. Fortunately, things have come on. A little bit since yeah then. but i just have to say dave was brilliant at that and i just you know when you showed it it, it was just like it looked like like science fiction to me it was so hard and, and it, I, it's also it's, it's a bit like playing battle toads or something like that you yeah. forget how hard a, a process is if you're if you're used to doing it and you do it every day mm. and when somebody new comes and they're going oh my god <laughs> so it, it was it was tough so i got him back the next day and said look dave I really can't do it. Can you just show me again? And yeah. I wrote it down. So said that the first step, step one, press this, step two. So I wrote it on a big long list and then I finally got, I got my head around it in the end. Which is a good job because we got so much work and so many <laughs> tunes. You know, we, we couldn't afford not to have yeah. a, a composer. So mm. I, I'm glad you stuck at it. <laughs> well, what were your setups like then? But I, I know there were some games companies where people were bringing in their own equipment from home and they were using their own sample sets and stuff and having to source stuff. Um, we, we had Amstrad computers at that point, like an Amstrad 40 or something with 40 megabytes of... That was cutting edge then. <laughs> was, um, was that all hooked up with MIDI and...? Not really, no, no. We, we, didn't, we, weren't re- we were only using the MIDI to demo songs, really, at that point, but it, it was just type it, you know, listening to a, a pitch or getting a chord and typing numbers in. It was as basic as that. Wow, so it's just an Amstrad. Did you have keyboards in there or, or yeah, well, mixers? We had a and... keyboard, but no, nothing too fancy. Um, we probably have a general MIDI module which had sort of sounds of trumpets, pianos, everything across the board, but nothing that sounded really like a piano or a trumpet. Do, do you think also like size limitations really help with creativity? You know, having having to do something in in such a small space. Um, I, I think you're always obviously you're constrained by the limitations so you're always trying to stretch those limitations and that's really important because we we were competing against everybody else who was as we still are who's making video games and if you had an edge or a slight edge and you could make it sound better than somebody else you'd sell a whole load more so Mm. it kept us in job for another week so Mm. you know i do i do feel like you know some even though we complained at the time about the memory limitations i do think it does make you be a bit more inventive I think you have to, I hate that phrase, think outside the box, but I think you, you had to, you like, you know, you had to kind of, how we're going to make this sound even half decent, you know, like, you know. And also it was a good training as well, because when you've only got four channels or eight channels, and that's just eight sources, uh, eight, you know, like eight notes totally, you've got a, it's a good foundation for composition. You've really got to think about the, the harmonic structure about creating a good melody that's strong that people mm. can la- latch on to. And then putting a rhythm behind it. So you, all the time, even though you've, you've only got something very basic, you're learning about mixing, you're learning about harmonies, melodies, and putting chords and chord structures and putting a whole process together. 
and that served as well even to today. So it was a good founding. Yeah, and I do feel like these days you can get these great giant synths. You can put one finger on the keyboard and it just sounds amazing. It's got this great huge swath of sound, you know, going on. And I do feel like it's, it's really easy these days to create something that sounds amazing, but is unremarkable. And I think that something we, we've got, we were told time and time again back in the day by the Tim and Chris Stampoffs to say, write a good memorable tune, a good memorable me- melody that people can remember because I still feel like the average person in the street likes to whistle a tune on the way to work in the morning or, you know, kind of thing. And I, there's not too many times you hear ambient tracks at, at number one in the charts, right? Because no one can remember it, you know? So if Lady Gaga is a top, a, a top hit, it's because it's got a good tune you can remember. So I think we had, we were at that beating into us from early on that you write a good tune, a good hook, something that you can remember. And I feel like it's, it stood as well over our careers, really, because people know us for writing memorable tunes. We, we, we do our best, you know, but I mean, I feel like that's important. Also, it's very hard to write a ambient tune when you've only got those, yeah. those lim- limitations. <laughs> so, you know, it, we, had to, we had to find some good melodies mm. that people could latch on to. Did you feel a bit overwhelmed when it like went to a CD soundtrack or you kind of had to figure out, I've got too much choice with this, you no. know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or you, you were like, this is great, I can do it. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was, a, a, as the technology improved, it was like a big relief every time, oh, we can do this now, I've wanted to do this for years, mm. I'll, I'll get on and do it. And so it was like being given a box of chocolates and stuffing your face full. Mm. And I do feel like sometimes, you know, with the modern with the stuff I've got now, which is amazing, it brings its own set of problems. Because, like, you yeah. know, when you're writing orchestral stuff, you have to make sure it sounds a bit out of tune or a bit out of time. Because that's what human beings do, right? Human beings don't play everything in time. And remember that when you're writing a flute part, you know, you've got to have a gap because a flute player takes a breath. If you write a flute part that's got no gaps in it, it sounds unnatural. You can't quite work out why. It's because flute players like any wind player, has to take a, take a breath. You have to put a stop there, imagine taking a breath, and then play it again. And when you're writing electronic music, it can be perfectly in time and great and perfectly in tune. But when you go for your, looking for a bass sound, you've got 10 million bass sounds to go through and to find the one you want, right? And it's just, you know, that's also a pain in the ass. So I feel like everything's got problems, whether it's modern or old, there's something about it you don't like, you know? And, and, and another thing, again, the limitations had taught us was that if you just play a note on a keyboard, you get a ding, and it, it's very static. So we had to learn how to modulate that sound, mm. to give it a bit of a wobble, or to bring the sound in slowly and let it fade off naturally, and have a bit of a pitch wobble on it. So you'd be emulating, even if it was on an NES or a GBA, you'd be emulating how the instruments would, would physically work in real life. And again, then now we've got these big libraries. You've still got to play it, so you're always... Um, modulating or mm. massaging the sound mm. to try and get a realistic performance. So when we're doing stuff, we, we could quantize it, but it sounds mechanical, it, it sounds really boring. So all the time we're trying to massage a performance so that when we've got a flute sound or we've got a clarinet sound, we want it to perform like a clarinet or a flute or a guitar, or whatever mm. instrument we, we're using. How, how tough was it to kind of you know, get inspiration for a soundtrack and how much would you like play a game or have references that you were given and uh, draw from other things as well? Oh, first of all, when we're writing, ideally we'd, we'd get a video or we'd actually get a, a, a copy of the game that we can actually physically play. Um, but the, the inspiration really comes from, you know, somebody like Kev coming in and he's got a character and you think, yeah, that's great. And instantly you're getting ideas for music. Then somebody brings a background in with these wonderful looking graphics and instantly it starts firing the imagination. So the, the inspiration isn't hard to get. It comes very, very quickly. It's turning that inspiration and the, those initial ideas into something that's presentable to a client and ultimately people who play the games. Yeah, and I, I, feel, I feel like these days any composer worth a salt, you know, someone comes to us and says, it's a frozen ice castle or something like that my mind's thinking straight away I need spiky things to represent the ice so like a glockenspiel or a uh, celeste or pizzicato strings that sounds like spiky ice to me or if it's a, a warm forest I'm thinking about bassoons or cellos or you know I think that we all just close our eyes and let your imagination because it is about telling a story isn't it yeah, so you, you just close your eyes and think what's that sound like to me you know and I think that I don't think the, I think the inspiration isn't the hard part I think the, you, you get that quite fast like Dave says I just think it's trying to find that tune that's good you know, like when we're, and you never really know until somebody else hears it. You might write something you love it, and everyone thinks it's shit. Yeah, so. that's true. And consequently, you might write something that you hate. Yeah. <laughs> 
and then you have to live with it forever because somebody thought it was good and you yeah. know, suddenly for years, well, decades, they say, oh, that's a great tune. You're thinking, it's so not. Be careful what you put down. I bet there's yeah. some bands with one-hit wonders that are just like... Mm. <laughs> really they, they might be and they might have to play it every night. Yeah, yeah. forever. Yeah. Fortunately, we've, we've written a lot of games. <laughs> well, uh, do you think video game music is kind of growing in acceptance and uh, people are regarding it a lot higher these days? Well, Not. I think just from last night, the, the amount of thank you everybody for coming last night, but the fact that so many people are interested in music and coming to see us perform, I think, I think that says it all. And so it's very humbling to be there and to play the, the, the tunes that we've worked on over decades to actually play them to people and to see people enjoying the experience. It's very, that's very cool. Yeah, and I, I also, I really believe that video game music, music has reintroduced your generation to purely instrumental music again. I feel like that was a thing that had kind of, it was just classed as the classical highbrow thing that people don't, you know, that's, they, don't want to, they don't hear that, but video game tunes, it's just tunes. It's, there's, most of the time there's no vocals, right? And I kind of feel like there's a whole massive amount of people now, just like my son's 20, and you know, all he listens to is video game tunes. Not because I'm, cause he's my son, just because that's what he likes. You know, and I think that's fantastic. You know, I think yeah, that it's, it's definitely, it's, I, feel like, I feel like the video game music will be the classical music of the future, that's what I think. Well, I, I think it really is, because when I was a kid, my, my mum, she used to take me to, um, it was called the, the Montfort Hall in Leicester, mm. and we'd go, we'd go and watch classical music, and, and really after that period, it, it almost died out, especially with a lot of guitar bands, and uh, I suppose as that generation um, got older and disappeared, a lot of the classical music went back, but it's had this big resurgence, resurgence so we've got big orchestras playing video yeah, like, games. Like reimagining soundtracks and ha yeah, yeah, having exactly. orchestras and all these huge performances. Yeah, and also, in some, sorry, in some respects, it's testament to the music written back then that you can turn it into a live orchestra. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. it shows that there's thought behind the chord sequences and the, it just, we, just, we didn't have the resources to make it into this big giant yeah. thing. But it, it, when you do do it, it, it completely works because... The, the thought we put, hopefully the thought we put into it. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're, we're, and there's nothing that beats going to the Royal Albert Hall or a big concert hall somewhere, and you're listening to the, your music being played by an orchestra when you first wrote it on the Game Boy. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Did people kind of look look down on video game music back in the? Uh, yeah, they, uh, well, it's been said a thousand times. You know, it's all plinks and plonks and stuff like that. And it had that reputation, but I think that's um, that's well and truly been buried now. Yeah, and I, I also think that there's, you know, there's every kind of genre in video game music. There's anything you want to hear, it's in there somewhere. There's metal to complete classical, it's everywhere, right? It's got every genre in it. It's got tons of vocal tracks now. It's become this great, gigantic force. And I really, I think you constantly hear almost like Game Boy noises in the modern dance tracks. Because you, do, you hear people going back and sampling that stuff, don't you, and putting it into dance tracks because it just, it's bled into everything now. And I feel like... I live in LA, right? And so um, I'm trying to film stuff. And you find that the older directors, like Dave says, still think it's a, it, video game music's plink plonk. You know, they don't understand it's completely changed. But the younger directors are all massive games players. Yeah, so they completely. totally get the whole games thing. And I've known a few composers get films from people playing the games and go, I like that. Let's hire that guy. You know, so I feel like it's, it's definitely. Sometimes it's still, it's still considered to be like movies, you know, younger brother, you know. And I think that that's wrong. I think that. In some respects, I think video game music is better than film music because a lot of film music these days can be a bit bland. I mean, if you think about the, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is, which is a big, giant, billion-dollar force, like how many of those tunes can you actually remember? There's not very many. I can remember the Avengers theme tune because that's like Alan Silvestri, an old-school composer who mm. writes great tunes, did Back to the Future. Yeah. You know, how many of the other Marvel tunes can you remember? I think that's wrong. But you can look, you remember plenty of video game tunes, can't you? But I, mean, I think you with, with, just, uh, with Marvel tunes... They seem to almost take the melodies out now, mm. don't they? And so they're suggesting the feeling with the orchestration, which is great. But the melodies to latch on, they seem to have almost taken them out mm. um, as a choice, an, an artistic choice. And that's a shame because when, certainly when we were younger, we used to love going to watch John Williams and Star Wars and mm. things like that. They, they were just such great tunes. And we remember those melodies mm. and they have that emotional connection with us. So that's the sort of thing that I think it's a shame that those big, strong melodies are almost discouraged now. Mm, I think it's very true. I feel like the, you go to see a big movie these days, it's very, it's very, like I say, epic, but unremarkable. You can't remember it. But it's great. You think it's great at the time. You walk out, I can't remember a note of that. And I guess 
that may be how people prefer it, but I think we're from the generation where we're like, That's right. we like to hear a good tune. I mean, if you took away Darth Vader's theme or exactly. Luke Skywalker's theme, it'd be like, it's not as good, is it? You know, so yeah. I feel like sometimes when, when directors say, Ooh, you know, I don't want to hear a melody, it sort of detracts from the scene. I'm a bit like, you should write a better scene, mate. If, you, if, you, <laughs> if that, yeah. that melody is going to detract from your scene, it should be a better scene, you know. Yeah, so. need a better, stronger story. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if someone was trying to like enter the video game music world now, uh, what, what do you think would be a good starting point or any tips? I, I, th- I think a good starting point would just be to not bother to and forget it. find a different <laughs> career altogether, to be honest. Because it, it's a tough gig. It was a tough gig back then. It's even tougher now because there's so many more people wanting to get into it. Mm. And, and it's hard work. You know, it's, there's the, the romantic side of a, a video game musician doing lots of video games it, it's it's not like that at all it, it's heads down see you at the end of the scene and as soon as you finish that one you're on to the next one so it, it's it's a tough gig so. yeah it's just, it's just hard and i think that you have to dedicate your existence to it right if you go into it half-assed it's but it's not going to work and also you could be the best composer in the world right and you just put the, your fantastic music on a on your own website or on youtube like the, the chance of people seeing it's very unlikely you have to find, we all, you know, like we, we could, both of us feel like we've flukes getting into the industry, right? Mm. And I feel like everyone that I talk to feels like it's a fluke. And I just think you've just got to find that path somehow. And you, you, sitting in your bedroom or whatever, writing your music is going to get you nowhere. I mean, you've got to get out and meet, like here, meet people, come to conventions, go to game jams. You know, you need to be in the same space that the people are doing the thing that you want to do, right? Whatever that is, get to know people. That's more important. I feel like it's 50% having the talent but the other 50% is having the, your networking thing, the people that you know. And that could be like, just, you know, just yeah. bumping into anybody anywhere. Like, you know, my wife says to me, go to everything you can possibly go to, because that one chance meeting, my, my, like you were just saying today, like yeah, somebody it, you may hear three years ago. So the first, time, high, yeah. the first time I came to Retro Mesa, there was a gentleman who walked over to me, asked me to sign his copy of whatever it is. And uh, in about 10 days' time, I'm going to continue working for his company that since then have expanded, they've become a lot bigger. And you just do not know who you're going to meet. So that it's, uh, and we, we used to talk about networking and, and that kind of thing. We used to go, yeah, 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 whatever, we've got social media. You've actually got to get out there mm. and meet people. And if you want to be a musician as well or a composer, it's no use mingling with people like us because we're your competition. You've got to go and mingle with the games directors <laughs> the people who are actually making the games or the people doing the graphics, you've got to make yourself useful to somebody, not another musician, because you're completely useless to them. Yeah, and also it's, it's not, you know, it, sometimes I think composers think it's what, you can, what they can do for you. It's not, it's what you can do for them. Yeah, exactly. You're, you are a service industry to the people that run the game, right? It's not the other way around. And so, you know, we spend our time just saying yes to, to anything if, if, if the guy can you change it can you change it can you change it yes no worries even if you think even the best piece in the world you just got to change it otherwise uh, could these, they're just going to fire you and find somebody else yeah and, and the reason for that is because game development is, is a dynamic thing it changes all the time so you could have done what you think is the best tune in the world if it doesn't fit with the gameplay the gameplay is everything in a game then your music is not working so you've got to be super adaptable and super willing to change even you know it even if you've been in it for decades, mm. you've, you've got to be up for changing things to suit the gameplay. Like I've got, I can give you two examples. Like my mate, uh, Danny Baranowski, who wrote the music for Super Meat Boy and Binding of Isaac and Crypt of Naku Dancer. He was that guy working in Lowe's, you know, in Home Depot in America, dreaming about being a video game guy. And uh, he, uh, he got a track on OC Remix. He actually remixed one of my tunes from Perfect Dark. And the guy that wrote a game called Cannabalt heard his music and said, do you want to write music for this game? And Cannabalt sort of launched Danny, got him, and equally, this Daniel Rosenfield, who used a C418 on Twitter, who's the guy that did all the, all the early, mine, the original Minecraft music. Um, Daniel was just a young 18-year-old kid, um, and when Notch was looking for music in a chat room, said, anybody in this chat room write any tunes? And Daniel was like, I do it. And then he got the gig. I mean, you know, and Daniel's probably the most followed composer in the world, mm. you know, and just from being in the right place at the right time and saying yes. And like, I think we both, we both always say, just say yes to everything, even if you haven't got a clue what it is. Just say yes and go home and Google it and find out what it is. And and it. There's a lot of like online projects yeah. that you can collaborate with yeah. and loads of tools to do that now. Yeah, yeah. It, you have having that motivation, isn't it? Because you, you yeah. you, you've got to dedicate your existence to it. There's no other way. 
How, how important is it to, to keep it fun as well with stuff like bands like you had last night and kind of have a bit of a separation from work as well? Uh, I personally think it's essential because when I, again, when I, in my early career, I was still playing in bands mm. and I, I still enjoy playing in bands. I, you know, I'm not the best musician in the world, but I, I really enjoy playing my saxophone or, or the keyboards. So it's nice to do something that's related, but it's certainly, it's, it's different. And I think that's, for me, I find that really important. No, it, it is. I think and there, is, there is a fun side to games, isn't mm. there? You oh, know, yeah, it, it's hard work, but there's, you know, I spent, I've, spent, I've spent the last good, good years working on the Mario Rabbids games, you know, Mario Rabbids, um, Kingdom Battle and Sparks of Hope. And I get on great with the creative director, David A, and the guys in the Ubisoft Milan, and we do have a good laugh. And I feel like, I remember when I was at Rare, I'd typing into Rare the, the, to Google, like, how to be a film composer, something like that. How do you do it? And I remember an article popped up by a guy called Richard Kraft, who I, and I've, I've since met in, in Los Angeles. He's a, he's a very big uh, uh, movie composer agent. He's done Elfman and lots, mm. all the big boys, you know. And he wrote, he wrote something. But something that stuck in my mind was, it, it said something like, people like composers to be, to be the people that can have a bit of a laugh and have a bit of a, bit of a giggle and be the bit of a personality, you know, and all that kind of thing. And they like, they like it to be that way. And I feel like even if that isn't your normal personality, because I, I feel like most composers yeah, are quite introvert. That's where I'm going wrong. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I, think like, I think that you've got to be able to, you know that BAFTA thing, there's a two, the, the actor's heads, there's a happy face and the, and, the, and, the smile, and the sad face. And I feel like a lot of composers that I know we're miserable most of the time, but when it comes to that bit, you need to be in public with people. You can put on that persona, being that you know happy, lucky, happy person, and all the rest of it. Even if that isn't you, and I feel like you have to learn to do that. People don't want to deal with introverts, and I know it's hard. And I feel, I feel like most us musicians are quite introvert. Really, we don't we don't want to. We, we sit in dark and room most of the day, not talking to anybody. You know, for eight hours a day or ten hours a day writing music, we don't want to talk to anybody. But I think you have to be able to put on that personality that probably isn't you. But it's a, it, you've got to have the outward skin. So when people talk to you, it's, they can think they yeah. work with, can work and, with you. And, and that's the thing about playing in bands, because right. it forces you to be sociable. You're, put, you're entertaining people. So I, that aspect mm. is, is quite important for that mm. sort of thing. Definitely. So just being Billy No Mates, slaving away in your room isn't going to work out for you. No. Is it important to explore different culture sounds as well and not just stick within your area? Um, I know, David, a lot of your tunes have been kind of from different cultures and, uh, you know, you've got more of a less kind of traditional video game sound with your stuff. Well, I, I guess so, but that's purely because I get bored doing the same thing. So if you can explore something, I don't know, from the Indian subcontinent, then that's that's great. And then you're learning new scales. I, I did a soundtrack for um, a Saudi prince not so long ago, <laughs> and uh, I had to learn how to write music using a different scale. Mm. And it, it just invigorates your music it's giving you a, a totally different feel different way of working so if the more of that the better really yeah and also the more strings to your bow you have the more employable you are right if we used to get cds to rare people sending in dance music tracks which were all fantastic but yeah. it's a bit like that's good for one thing if you can write lots and lots of different styles yeah, you, you, you know it's like having a a machine gun with bullets in it. The more bullets you have that you can fire out of more different things, the more chance you're going to get employed. If you've got one bullet and one thing you do, you're going to miss the target maybe. So it's best to build. And especially video games, you get asked to write the, the most ridiculous things you've ever heard of, from complete this to complete that. You know, you've got to be, able to be versatile, make sure you can write lots of different things. And also, one of the things I did learn at college was that, I think it was Haydn or Mozart or whatever it was. I think Haydn... I think, I think Haydn's before Mozart, I forget. But anyway, I, think, I feel like one of them learned to write symphony form by studying the other person's stuff. So you, he took Haydn's symphony form and realised it was the A idea, the B idea, the development section, whatever it is, and he just pull all his music out and put your music in there and see what you learn how it works. So like us, yeah. we have to write a pop track or whatever it is, and you might... On Metallica track, you get a Metallica track, you work out here's the verse, here's the middle eight, here's the chorus, and you can work, you can see the structure, and then you put your music, it's like take the, the meat off the skeleton and put your meat on that skeleton. So you learn how it works. What, how it, so if after a reggae track, which I, you know, I don't like reggae, I don't, don't listen to it, but you know, if I had to do it, I'm sure David's that easy, you'd listen to it, wouldn't you? You work out how it works. Uh, I actually, I used to listen to a lot of Bob Marley when I was a kid. Oh, right. so, yeah, <laughs> I actually <laughs> like that. Kind of stuff, so. But it's true, you can, yeah. that's how you work it out, isn't it? You, oh, yeah, you listen to the track, work it out, and put your own things in the skeleton, you know. And, and, and that doesn't stop. So constantly, we're always analysing stuff. So when we listen to music, we're, we're not kind of getting the emotional vibe. We're probably listening to the, the, 
the mm. chord structure, the instrument structure, how it's working, the tempo of the thing, or it doesn't stop. You never turn it off, really, which is a shame because it's not really until we're on a night out in a club or something where mm. you actually listen to music for the sake of listening to mm. music, and it's in, you know, it's because we're so analytical. The other thing that we do, well, I'm sure Grant does the same thing, we hone in on certain frequencies mm. to listen to, say, what the bass guitar is doing. Or, <laughs> and, and so you, you get so used to it, you'll miss the rest of the track because you're listening to a guitar part. I, mm. Isolating it in your yeah. mind. Yeah. Oh, come, all, all the time. Mm. So we, we, after a while, you do listen to music in a different way. Yeah. So, so it's a real difference, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, one last question before we go to the audience questions. And uh, what are some of the video game soundtracks you guys really enjoy? What, from other artists? Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoy the Metal Gear Solid soundtracks. I think that's mm. got a great theme, and, and some of the, the, the latest stuff was really quite emotional. And, and the more emotional, the better, really, for the bigger games. Or if it's a smaller game, I, I just like fun. It's got to be quirky. Yeah, I, th I think for me, I, I, think, I feel like Zelda Link to the Past is my favourite soundtrack of all time. I just think that's a fantastic piece of music. You know, that whole, I remember playing that game and just thinking, oh, this is brilliant, you know. So... I, really, I think that's my favourite that I really like. Um, I think a lot, some of the modern soundtracks, sometimes, you know, they are a bit unremarkable. They, they sound fantastic and epic, but I can't remember any of it. And I think the ones you can, you, the, that stand out to every one of the ones that have got a great big tune that we can remember, you know, whatever, or something quirky, catchy about it. So I do feel like, I don't think I listen to a ton of music, video game music. I mean, listen to more film scores, probably. That's why I listen to more. And I kind of feel, I don't listen to video game scores because if I want to write my own stuff, I want to try and pull it out of my own head. Yeah. And I think it's inevitable you're going to copy something that mm. somebody yeah. else, you always do. But you try to, you know, keep it out of your, in your own brain. Yeah, well, um, the, the sources we want are the sources that mean something to us. Yeah. So it's, it's not about listening to, um, sorry, sorry, um, other game composers. It's, mm. it's a different source of inspiration. Mm. Awesome. Well, can we get a round of applause for David Wise and Grant Kirko? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> and if uh, anybody has any questions, put your hand up and uh, we've got a roving mic. That Here he is. Come around. Yeah. So I was just thinking about uh, what do you think of the availability of video game music in many different uh, soundtracks, especially Nintendo is widely unavailable for most people to listen to outside of pirate uploads on YouTube or other sites. Yeah, I don't know why they do that. Like, Nintendo is particularly funny about that. Um, I don't know why. I don't know whether they don't care about it. It just seems they never want to release anything. Um, I think we were just talking about that today, actually. It's a weird thing why they don't want to do it. I, I feel like Nintendo have got such a massive wealth of great music. Why on earth they don't stick it out on Spotify and everything else? I don't know why. It seems crazy to me. There's no work. It's, all you have to do is upload the WAV files. It's not very difficult. I don't know why they don't do it. Or even vinyl releases, which yeah. we're really seeing yeah. on uh, yeah, I think, video uh, soundtracks. Mm. Uh, we, we get a lot of people and they'll buy vinyl because they want something tactile to say, well, you yeah. know, I love the game, I'm supporting it, and they come to a show like this, they want the composer to sign it. It's because it, it means something to them. And if... You know, if a company isn't releasing them, I, I do think they are missing out on that emotional connection with the game the, um, uh, and the player, which is a shame. So hopefully one day they might change that. Yes, the Nintendo are particularly bad at it. Uh, it seems they're the worst to me. And sometimes we both run into the, the, the situation where someone's wanted to perform our soundtracks live with an orchestra and Nintendo tried to stop them doing it. And so they do seem to do that quite a lot. And I don't really know why. I actually can't legally do it anyway, but it does, it crops up every now and then, and we both kind of go, what, what, you know, what, what's the harm in it? You know, it just seems crazy to us, so I don't know. Are there any other questions? Um, hi. Oh. So, um, well, you've been talking a lot about melodies, and you've both written some really great, beautiful melodies over the years. Uh, from my experience, it's very difficult to write that beautiful melody. So, what is your approach to, like, writing a good melody? My approach is, uh, once I've got a melody I'm okay with, I will just put it on repeat and repeat. And it's that kind of small changes, big gains type of thing. So I'll listen to it until it really starts to grate and annoy me. And I'll start moving things really slightly and trying. It's, it's got to be liquid. It's got to flow. And if you listen to something 200 times, it becomes apparent if the melody is just needs a bit of tweaking. And so I might spend days on a melody just tweaking, tweaking, tweaking until suddenly it'll fall into place and go, that's it, and get on with it. 
But um, I mean, some come really quickly, but a lot of them do take a lot of repeat and listening to it over and over again, especially if it's an important game theme. You, you really want that to be right because you'll be using that a lot throughout the game. So that, that's my approach. Put it on repeat until it annoys you. And I also, there's little tricks about writing melodies. Like if you listen to the greats kind of thing, like if you, look, for instance, take the medley melody to E.T., right? Which goes, da, 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 da. We all know that, right? The next phrase is, da, 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 which is the same rhythm, but different notes. So this trick, like John Williams, is, you know, it's very classically like, here's the melody, here's the rhythm, here's the same rhythm, slightly different notes, and da, 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 da same rhythm again, different notes. Da, 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 da. And so, you know, like something like Harry Potter, uh, uh, not, uh, like something like, uh, not Harry Potter, um, is Peter Pan score. That's da, 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 da. So he's repeating things subtly so it gets lodged in your brain, right? So melody writing, like Dave said, it's a little bit like you've got to have enough repetition in it that it hooks it. If you write a completely meandering piece of melody, no one's going to remember it. You have to, it's quite simplistic in some ways. You have to make sure you've got little repeating things in it that, that sticks in people's brains. And I, think, I feel like we both learned that really early on, because we kept getting mm. told, listen to Nintendo, listen to Nintendo, and you could see how they would they have stuff that we, you, could, you, you just couldn't get out of your head. So there's little techniques like that that help reinforce that. So you, you might try and write something all over like this, which is maybe impressive, but no one can remember it. Stick to the, those little things, little, little repetition, similar notes, similar patterns, and it sticks. I think when you start analysing melodies as well, you'll realise what a short range that mm. main core melody is written in. There won't be many notes in it, and it's a good exercise to do. Uh, and once you start analysing and realise it doesn't really stray far, and it's in complete structures, then when you start using that, those kind of rules in, in your own music, suddenly it starts to get a lot, a lot simpler for other people to understand. Because really, it's about singing a melody to somebody else. You want them to sing it back to you. Yeah, well, I, th I think we're going to actually uh, end it there. Thank okay. you, guys. All right, yes, thank you. Cheers. Thank you.